Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on microseismic hypocenter location using an artificial neural network. The reason why we are interested in the problem of uh, location inversion is because human activities, including hydraulic fracturing, wastewater injection, and mining, have resulted in a sharp increase in the number of earthquakes observed in historically quite tectonic areas around the world. In addition to causing considerable economic losses, such events are increasingly becoming a threat to public safety. Uh, and for threat mitigation, a traffic light system is usually implemented, uh, which requires real-time location and magnitude determination capabilities. So we've seen uh, in, the, in, in the recent times that neural networks uh, are gaining a huge popularity uh, due to their ability to learn complex representations and data and delivering um, solutions in near real time. Looking at the literature, we also find that convolutional neural networks have been used for hypocenter location and origin using historical uh, data for training. However, one downside with these methods is that uh, convolutional neural network requires a huge amount of data to train uh, those thousands or tens of thousands of uh, parameters. Uh, and therefore, uh, the amount of data available may not be sufficient for uh, good enough training of those complicated networks. Uh, therefore, uh, in the recently concluded SCG annual meeting, we saw Bernard et al. also used a convolutional neural network, but in line with our uh, strategy here in this presentation, they also used synthetic data to train the network. In contrast to their approach, what we propose here is the use of an artificial neural network with P-wave travel time picks as inputs for precise location inversion. Uh, just to uh, make sure all the viewers are on the same page, what is a feed-forward neural network? It is um, it is a set of neurons organized in layers in which evaluations are performed sequentially through the layers. And for our problem, uh, at the input, we have uh, neurons corresponding to the number of stations that we have in the monitoring network. At the output, we have uh, neurons uh, telling us the hypocenter location. Therefore, we have uh, neurons corresponding to the location coordinate. So if we have, uh, we're thinking of a 3D problem, then we have three neurons at the output, one for each coordinate X, Y, and Z. More specifically, what we do at the input side is we do not feed uh, the observed travel times at, as it is. Rather, we subtract them from the mean observed travel times at all stations. So this helps us eliminate uncertainty due to uh, unknown origin time. Uh, furthermore, we normalize these inputs to accelerate the training process. So what we are going to do now is first we are going to sh go through some synthetic tests and we'll try to study a few parameters that may vary the accuracy. And once we have a good understanding of those parameters, then we'll try and do the uh, test the performance of our method on real data. So what, would you, what you see in this slide is the velocity model that you use for the synthetic test. And this black rectangle shows the seismicity zone. So we expect our events to be located within uh, this zone of interest. And what we are going to do is we are going to first uh, generate synthetic data using equispaced sources from within this seismic city zone. And we will be receiving them on uh, equispaced receivers on, at the zero depth. And then we will use that data to train the neural network because uh, the, the training data that we have generated constitutes our input and our output or the labels are the locations uh, that were used to generate that data. Uh, and once we have trained our neural network, we will use 100 randomly distributed uh, sources to, uh, to predict their locations using the trained neural network. So we choose a neural network with four hidden layers, each containing 40 neurons. The activation function in the hidden layers is the rectified linear unit, whereas the final, final layer is linear. And as I mentioned, after training the neural network, uh, we test performance on 100 randomly distributed source locations. So the first thing we do is we study the effect of noise in test data, which may happen uh, due to errors in picking, for example. So we will consider two cases. The first one on the left uh, is the case when we have low noise. Uh, for example, uh, we consider uh, noise, uh, noise with Gaussian distribution with a standard deviation of 10 milliseconds in the first case. And in the second case, we will consider uh, noise with a standard deviation of 20 milliseconds. So, uh, so what you see here are histogram uh, showing the errors in each case. So let's first look at the first row. So this is the case corresponding to the 10 millisecond standard deviation of error. And this is the error histogram for the X coordinate. And this is for the Z coordinate. So what we observe here is uh, pretty much 
error centered around uh, zero mean in both cases. And we have a standard deviation of 14 meters. So the maximum error we see here are about uh, 40 meters for uh, X and Z coordinates. Now, what happens when we increase this, uh, the error in this uh, error standard deviation by twice? So what we observe is depicted here. Uh, of, of course, we observe a flatter Gaussian curve here in both cases. However, the, the, the peak error, the largest error do not increase as significantly. So again, we see the largest error to be about 50 or 60 meters for both the X and Z coordinates. Uh, and if we look at the numbers of, uh, in terms of the increase in standard deviation, it does not, does not increase uh, by, by the factor of two as we have increased the noise. So there is some increment of course, um, but it's not by a factor of two. So the next thing, next thing we study is, is the effect of number of receivers. So what we are going to consider is we are go going to consider two cases, one in which uh, we, uh, we will have a um, large number of receivers, which we consider in the previous case. Uh, so all this example that we sh uh, saw were, were done using, uh, using all the receivers, which, which is equal to the num number. We have 121. Uh, so what we do here is uh, in, in the first column, what you see is a standard deviation of 10 meters per meter, 10 milliseconds. All right, so the next thing that we study here is the effect of number of receivers uh, on the error histograms. Uh, so what we are going to do is in the first case, we are going to keep the number of, keep the standard deviation of the uh, noise fixed in the travel times, and we are going to vary the, the number of receivers. So in the first row, what you see is our error histograms corresponding to 121 receivers. And in the second row, uh, the number of receivers are 31. So we increase the, uh, we decrease the number of receivers by a factor of four. So of course we see again that uh, the Gaussian curve has flattened in both cases, however, uh, we see the number of uh, the, the, the peak error goes to about 100 meters in both cases for both for X and Z. Whereas in case of uh, looking at the standard deviation increase, so here from 14 meters, it increases 29, so almost twice. So by, by reducing the number of stations by four, we increase the standard deviation of error by a factor of two, as we observe here for both X and Z coordinates. Uh, now, in this case, what we uh, see is we take now the case of um, noise with 20 millisecond of uh, 20 millisecond standard deviation. And again, we do the same exercise. We take 121 receivers in the first row and 31 receivers in the second row. And now we see that the standard deviation increases from 21 to 38 here and from 24 meters to 42 meters here. So essentially we observe uh, a similar behavior um, is, uh, despite that uh, we had a different noise level. Uh, now, given that we, this is probably the worst case scenario where we have very high noise and very few number of receivers, we see that the largest error that we observe is about 100, 110 uh, meters for both X and Z coordinates, which is still pretty good given the, given the circumstances. Uh, the third thing that we study is the effect of number of training sources. So another variable that we may have is the number of training sources. However, this should be noted that a training for our neural network is done offline. Uh, and once the network is trained, we bring the network online and then it could perform uh, near real time uh, location inversion. So therefore, this is a one-time cost. Uh, and just to understand how much cost is involved in training a neural network, we see if we have 451 uh, training sources, then it takes up only about 28 seconds for training. And uh, the standard deviation of X and Z errors are pretty small. However, if we, if we reduce the number of training sources to save cost, uh, which, which actually does not uh, account to be a lot, really in terms of uh, training, uh, the standard deviation of error increases by a lot. And therefore our recommendation here is to use as many training sources as possible because once the training is done, we can take the network, uh, bring the network online and perform near real time evaluations. And therefore it will be very important to, to get precise uh, and accurate solutions to have as many number of training sources as possible. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to study how the method performs in for real data sets. So here we have uh, real data from Woodford Gas Shell Reservoir in Oklahoma. What you see here in blue is the monitoring network. And these are the, the well locations shown. And this 3D cube is the seismicity zone. So again, we would expect uh, that the seismicity will be located within this zone of interest. And therefore we are going to uh, build our network, neural network solution by using synthetic data uh, coming from the seismicity zone. So what we have here is that the monitoring net network contains 911 stations. We use five more than 5,000 regularly distributed sources within an interval of 90 meters from each other for training. So we take these 5,184 sources, we, gen uh, we run the forward uh, modeling engine and we compute travel times at all of these locations using, uh, using the icon solver at all of these 911 stations. Uh, to, be, to train the neural network. Uh, and we use a neural network with three hidden layers containing 250 neurons in each hidden layer. Now in real data, what we, we may have is, so when we are go, after training, when we try to predict solutions and, and feed the observed travel times, we may have some missing picks. And this is what we observe. So uh, we get in our real data, uh, the best case we see is we have, uh, out of the 911, we have about 40 or 50 missing receivers or missing picks. And the worst case we see is about 500 uh, picks missing. So in, in all cases, what we do is we use Kriging interpolation, which in our observation performs very well uh, to interpolate the missing travel times. So here are the travel time locations that we obtain on the X and Z plane. So here is the X plane, uh, sorry, here's the X axis, here's the there is the Z axis and in, in red cross are shown the neural network solution and black circles are the diffraction stacking solution. And therefore what we observe, a very interesting thing is that neural network solutions are more constrained in depth and therefore show better precision of the method compared to diffraction stacking. Uh, we observe the same thing on the, on the Y and Z plane that neural network solutions are again more cons better constrained in depth compared to the refraction stacking solution. On the XY plane, uh, we observe similar solutions from both neural network and refraction stacking, whereas uh, um, we see a few events in refraction stacking that are a bit uh, more, let's say, away from the cluster. So what we do to verify or double check our solution is that we go back and use our forward engine to compute uh, travel time solutions using the inverted source locations for both diffraction stacking and neural networks. And, and we try to compare them with the observed P wave travel time picks. And this is what we get in terms of the travel time residuals. Uh, as we see that neural network uh, gives us um, a better or less travel time residuals compared to diffraction stacking, giving us sort of, uh, or telling us that the travel times match uh, with the observed travel times better than uh, with the diffraction stacking case. So this gives us more confidence in our neural network solution. All right, so let us bring this to a close. What we have done here is we have demonstrated the use of neural networks for precise and near real-time hypocentral location inversion. The neural network uh, to be emphasized is trained using synthetic P-wave travel times and therefore no uh, historical data uh, is needed to train the neural network. And therefore what it, this does is it makes the neural network vulnerable to the accuracy of the, of the background velocity model that we used use for our forward modeling engine. And this is one of the, uh, let's say, challenges in our method uh, to overcome uh, in the future. Um, so what we do first is we study the effect of noise in test data. Um, and, and also we study the effect of uh, number of receivers and the number of training sources uh, in predicting accurate, uh, accurate locations for us. We then test the performance of the method on real data from a shale reservoir in Oklahoma. And we observe that uh, we get pretty precise uh, locations in this case compared to diffraction stacking. And we also observed smaller travel time receivables by comparing the observed travel time with those simulated using the neural network prediction. So what we do is we take these locations, we go back to the forward engine, do the simulation again, and compare them, compare the travel times with those observed, 
observed by picking the observed data. So one of the downside that we may have uh, with this method, and this should be uh, this should be highlighted, is that we may have uh, receivers which with missing picks, right? And therefore, what we do here is we use Craigian interpolation, and we found Craigian interpolation to give us remarkably very smooth travel time updates. And therefore, uh, in our observation, it does not affect our results very much. But this is something that needs further study. So for case, for example, for cases when you have a very few receivers with picks, how does uh, Craigian interpolation perform? So in this case, what we had was out of 911, we had the worst case was about 500 missing uh, picks. Uh, so therefore still had uh, a big chunk of uh, receivers that had those travel time picks uh, to help the Craigian interpolation. But, uh, another study is needed really to understand how the accuracy degrades for the Craig interpolation method. So one thing should be highlighted that this method uh, is trained offline. And then uh, once it's trained, it can be brought online for uh, near real time predictions. And it, it takes really a few milliseconds to predict a location corresponding to uh, an event. So therefore, if you are thinking of real time uh, implementation, what we need actually is uh, to have full automation that we should couple this system with, a f with an automatic uh, earthquake detection method. So as soon as an event occurs, this system will flag that event and a picking algorithm will then pick the first travel travel times, which will then be fed to our algorithm to, uh, to uh, yield uh, the travel time, the, the, the source locations in real time. So with that, I would like to bring this presentation to a close and thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. You can contact me by email as well. Thank you very much.